and welcome everyone to the beautiful butterfly show i'm your host b fly I want to say happy tuesday to you guys out there um hope that this week is kicking off on a great note for you guys it's kind of kicking off on a rainy note uh for me here but nevertheless it's gonna uh it's been a great day so hey what else can i ask for but we are welcoming you back to another episode Episode of the beautiful butterfly show uh tonight we got a special guest uh that's going to be joining us we got kimberly h coleman uh, she's going to be joining us she is an author speaker advocate model fashionista uh if you will and she is just an amazing amazing lady and so um i came across through her um through social media um her energy was just amazing and so that's one of the things that drawed me to her, connected me to her. And so tonight she's going to come on. She's going to be talking um, to us about her journey, journey of life. She has a lot of things to share with us tonight. Um, so I am looking forward to it. As I ask you guys always, make sure you share the show. Uh, Facebook, Instagram, all of those great things because we never know uh, what could be shared on the show that can impact somebody's life um, and make a difference. So. Uh, we're not going to delay any longer. We're going to bring our special guest of the hour on here. Kimberly, you there? Hello. Hi, Bianca. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm wonderful. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Ab absolutely. I said we're like in a, in a garden of love. You know, she got <laughs> the roses and I got the butterflies. So we're just, we're just bathing in the bliss. <laughs> Yes. 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 Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So for the folks out there, uh, this may be their first time seeing your beautiful face and hearing about you. Tell them a little bit about who's Kimberly Coleman. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, thank you for that introduction, by the way. It's, yeah. it's always beautiful to connect with uh, queen sisters like yourself. Who are doing what you're doing so thank you for having me uh, i am originally from texas and lived half my life in texas and half my life on the west coast i'm a little bit country a little bit rock and roll on the scene yeah, yeah i currently live in kentucky with my family um, wife of 22 years got a bunch of really cool kids <laughs> and, <laughs> and i have been on a life journey of um, Finding joy beyond trauma. I am a uh, survivor and overcomer of childhood abuse and yeah. domestic violence and colorectal cancer, and I'm currently an ostomate. And so I'm, I'm just sharing, you know, some of the really cool things that I'm getting from these life lessons that yeah. I've been able to uh, be on. So that's just awesome. a little bit about me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, um, and, and one of the things, um, you know, it, it's amazing what you find out or discover about people um, through social media. Uh, because when I first um, saw you, I saw the modeling pictures, the beautiful modeling pictures, you guys, I have to add. Uh, and so I was like, oh my gosh. And the more I got to hear about your story, I'm like, wow. You know, and so it's amazing how we can connect with people um, and their stories throughout. And so just to take us back a little bit, because I know that you're um, a child abuse advocate, um, domestic violence advocate. And so take us back a little bit to the child abuse and how you grew and and healed through that process because you know a lot of people um sometimes are still affected by those experiences even in adulthood you know they can carry on through and so for you how did you get on the other side of it to where where you are now wow um well the, the first step was telling my story yeah so like exactly what you're saying, I did not tell my story to anyone until I was 26. Wow. Yeah. So I had carried that secret yeah. uh, for a long time mm -hmm. and those secrets for a long time. And then, uh, you know, I, I was on the verge of suicide because it just was so traumatic uh, wow. once I started talking about it with my family and their reaction. Yeah. And uh, so then I got into therapy and and started to find my way over the mountain, 
Yeah. And so, so basically for the last, uh, I'm 53 now. So for the last 27 years, I have been doing this work of, of healing Yeah. Um, through, you know, these different things that have happened. Absolutely. Uh, and, and <clears throat> you know, for that experience of, because a lot of people talk about, you know, that initial reaction uh, from their family um, kind of makes or breaks, you know, some type of situations. And so for you, what was that experience like from you? What kind of feedback did you get back from your, you know, family, you know, telling them about some things that occurred? Well, it was, it was tough, uh, yeah. you know, like talking with my mom and uh, my sister and, you know, the initial pushback was, uh, it was your fault. And yeah. you're the reason that this has happened and why our family has fallen apart. And yeah. so that continual narrative that I had had throughout my childhood of being unworthy and um, all of the negative things that they had spoken to my life. Yeah. Um, because of the trauma they had gone through, <laughs> you know, yeah. right. And so, yeah, it, it was that initial reaction and I continue to get that um through for quite a while. Yeah. But I just kept pushing through, just kept going to therapy. I just knew that that, that life of feeling like those things were my fault, like I was um not worthy, didn't feel authentic to me. So right. I was pushing and hoping for more. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was really hoping for more. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know, because, you know, when we when we get the, the courage to tell people things that have happened within us, I think in our minds, you know, we have this mindset of, OK, this is how I want them to react, you know, or at least how we're hoping they'll react, you know. And so then when it actually happens, sometimes we're kind of taken back like, wow, you know, this this is the response. And I found, you know, even through my own experience, I um, dealt with um, sexual assault in, in high school. And so I felt very blamed, very blamed um, by some family members. I felt very blamed um, by peers, of course. Um, but it, it's interesting that no one ever takes the time to look at the other side of the picture, you know, of, you know, like you said, well, it was your fault. You caused it, you know. And so why do you think, I guess, the immediate response sometimes is we caused it or if we wouldn't have, you know, did this or we wouldn't have, you know, why is that the, the response that so many people get in those situations? Well, it seems like that initial pushback is it stems from like shame. And yeah. built on their on their part. Yeah. Because now as a mom having children, I know when my kids are off or something, mm -hmm. you know, and so yeah. playing it back and seeing me as a child and many of us as children who have experienced this type of assault, we change and we exhibit differently, we show up differently, and, and we're trying to give you all the signs without yeah. seeing it. And so if you're not saying and having a conversation, then they can live in denial. So then right. once the information comes out, whenever it comes out, right. you have to break down that wall of denial. And part of that denial is that they yeah. knew yes. on some level. Right. And, and that guilt and shame is pushing them to uh, kind of keep you quiet about mm -hmm. it. Yeah. That's yeah. what it seems like it stems from. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, and the thing about it, especially, um, and it's interesting, I we had this conversation, I was actually at a grief workshop and talked about the different levels of grief. Uh, Sometimes people believe grief is just when someone is dying, has died. Uh, but we grieve, you know, experiences that we have. And so um, one of the things I, I heard you mention is, you know, going to therapy. Um, and so when was that point um, that you knew that you wanted to go to therapy? Because a lot of us, you know, we just continue to suppress it. OK, that happened. Let me keep moving. You know, when did you get to that moment? Like, you know what? I need I need to to be able to pour this off onto somebody, you know, and talk to about this. 
Well, it, it's exactly what you're saying. I was just going along my life, living in the Bay Area, you know, yeah. and, and just denial. I had I had put it away. Yeah, I thought I packed it away. Yeah, but I can look back and clearly see I had not, based on the relationships I was having. And yeah, creating, you know, co-creating and and so you know at, at, at this point I was in a relationship with someone mm-hmm. and um, I got pregnant and. I was like, what am I going to do? I, I don't feel like I could ever be a good mom. Yeah. I don't feel worthy of any of that. Mm-hmm. And one thing I did know was like, I'm sitting on this moment of like, do I go forward with this or how do I, what am I going to do? Right. And so I just knew in order, I, I just knew that I needed to do something different. And so yeah. therapy was, it was yeah. presented to me and I was like, I'll take it. I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> but I just was feeling so bad about myself. Yeah. I was getting a lot of familial pressure, a lot of just everyone was just heaping on me and I, I can only take so much. I was breaking. Yeah. Under that pressure. Yeah. And, uh, so, yeah. It was time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I want to ask you, um, and you mentioned <clears throat> about relationships. Um, did what happened um, in your childhood affect um, the way you operated um, in relationships um, after that point? How did that affect, <laughs> you know, those relationships? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The stars. Yes. Because yeah. you know what? what we experience in our homes is what we take into our relationships. Absolutely. It just, it's, I'm not blaming anyone. It just is what it is. Right. right. We, we right. do what we learn and what we know. Absolutely. And so, of course, the first relationship, you know, serious relationship that I get into mm-hmm. out of, you know, right after high school, I was like 19, by the time I got into the serious relationship, well, of course I've attracted what I just came from. Right. And I didn't realize it because it didn't come in the same package. Yeah. But yeah. It was the same gift. Same gift. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, we 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 go out and, and we're thinking that we're making these different choices. And really, we're just picking what we know. And that hurt energy attracts other hurt energy. Yeah. You know, so you just end up with a bunch of hurt people hurting people. And that's what that's what ended up happening for nine years, you know. Yeah. It, it wasn't physical. It's was just, it was verbal words hurt more than physical though. Absolutely. And it lasts longer. Yeah. Uh, you know, and um, the thing about that, um, it's amazing how uh, when we get in relationships, it, it really changes the dynamic um, of how we, we handle people. You know, when we get in relationships, um, I, I know for me, my trust level was, <laughs> you know, kind of non-existent. Like, you know, I was very apprehensive of people. I, I felt like I couldn't, tr- I feel like I constantly had to watch people and what they were doing. And if they had a hidden agenda, you know, it, it was very impactful, you know, in that way. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah you end up being hyper vigilant. Yeah. And waiting for the shoe to drop. So yeah. you know, I look at a lot of my earlier friendships with women and they were horrible. It's not because of them. It's just, I didn't trust them because I didn't trust my first uh, female relationship. Yeah. And so I just carried that into every female. So I had developed this narrative that I had a better, I can get, a, I'm the person that gets along better with guys. Yeah. Than women. And it yeah. Was, and it yeah. Was, it's, you know, it, and, and it was true for a while because mm-hmm. I didn't know and value who I was. Yeah. And even who my mother was as yeah. a woman and, and the yeah. choices that she had to make. Yeah. Absolutely. So, you know, it's like I can see, oh, yeah, I, I carried that. And those relationships showed that because you know what? When we go out, we create these relationships and they echo the stories that we've been told. So yeah. someone's constantly coming back and telling us all the stuff we've heard growing yeah. up. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, oh, I'm on the right track. <laughs> right? Right. So attract that. It's, yeah. 
it's really intense that way. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and you mentioning, you know, attracting um, the same thing, um, but it's just in a different box with a different boat. You know, it's like, you know, it's like, I don't know. It's like the, you know, those old movies where you see the, the, the people on Christmas get the same pair of socks from their great aunt or great grandma. And you're like, oh, you know. <laughs> so, I know what this box is. Yeah, I know what this is. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely absolutely and uh a listener in the chat room Gwendolyn Jones she says growing up in many black homes you never talk about it um what goes on in the house stays in the house so what took place outside the house um of the house you didn't talk about that either uh she wants to know what is your take on that in that that stereotype that even still you know is prevalent even today well it's true it's it's yeah. spot on. That is how I was raised. Like I said, I, I was raised in Texas primarily. And so my parents are very conservative and it's like, yeah, you don't. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you like life. Yeah. Yeah. That, that type of energy. And yeah. so that's part of why I held it. I plan to carry it to my grave. That yeah. was the plan, you know, yeah. and uh, it just, I don't know. It, at some point, I'm, I'm glad that we did move mm -hmm. out of uh, Texas and go to California because that's where, you know, they're, they're more like, okay, therapy is a thing here. Yeah. You know, at that time, this was the 90s. So mm -hmm. I, it's like in the South, even when I went to therapy, my family in the South knew about it. And, you know, they would just say church is all you need. And yeah, you know, God is all you need, and God is your healer. And yeah. you know, they I was shunned for um, for going to therapy. I was I because it wasn't something that was something we do. We do people, yeah. Yeah. you know, and and yeah. it was yeah. So <laughs> yeah, spot on with that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, uh, because I, I wanted to ask you <clears throat> the moment that you decided uh, that you were going to say something, because like you said, you you were planning on like I'm, I'm, I'm holding this forever. Um, and so what made you decide I want to tell like I'm not I'm not keeping this inside anymore? You know, what happened was growing up. Um, I was the oldest of my siblings. I have two younger siblings, um, but my sister is six years younger than me and, and my mom. And so my dad was my abuser and he was abusing me and giving me the narrative that I, that by him abusing me, I was saving the family. So I became the family savior. It was that type of role that yeah. I was passed into yeah. So, you know, I felt like it was my job to keep this secret in order to keep our family together. It was my job to endure the torment yeah. in order to keep my dad home. It was my job to to go through all of that so that my little sister wouldn't be touched. And yeah. so I took all of that on like that was my role. Wow. And then my little sister came to me and she was about to go to college. And she told me that it had happened to her. Wow. And that's when the veil of denial for even me came off because I'm thinking I'm doing these things to keep my family intact, to keep my sister protected, to protect my mom. And that wasn't happening. And then I realized that I need help because yeah. all of that stuff that I had endured was, was a lie. Yeah. 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 And, and the thing about it is to hear about you in a sense, being a protector, you know, kind of taking, taking that raft from that individual to protect those around you. Um, you know, and, and, you know, it amazes me um, that a lot of people have experienced that, you know, they go through that mindset, especially when they have siblings. Um you know, to protect the other ones. And, and you say, you know, well, I'm going to take, you know, take this for them. And um, so for you moving forward um, and, and 
sharing and, and going to therapy, um, having different thoughts shared with, with family members and all of that. Um, the healing process, when, when did the healing um, begin for you? The minute I started therapy. Yeah. Now therapy is a more of a slow, slower going vehicle. Right. So I was in therapy for a few years. Yeah. And then I moved to San Diego from the Bay Area and I, I didn't have the access to my therapist. However, I found like this, um, this group and they do like seminars where it's called PSI seminars and you go and you do all of these exercises and you come face to face. It's like four days of just face to face with all the stuff you went through. So it's a lot of, yeah. crying and it's a lot of, oh. and that accelerated my growth because it helped me to take accountability for the things that I wanted to take accountability for. And it helped me to let go of the things that I did not right, <laughs> right, right. take an accountability for. So then I, I ended up doing like a year's worth of that accelerated work. And yeah. it gave me like so many tools um, to put in my toolbox. So I was 30 at the time that I took it. Well, yeah, 29 or 30. And I met my husband. <laughs> now. Yeah. When I was in, I had, after I'd taken the course and, you know, we were just dating and I had come out of this other relationship. So I was like, I'm not in the right. market for all of that. Right. I need to work on myself so I can have something different. Right. And so then we, you know, just kept dating. And then, then I realized it was serious. And I was like, hey, if you want to be with me, you got to take all this. You got to do this too, because I don't want to go through any of that again. I want yeah. something different. Yeah. So he, but he and I both did a year of that, like just accelerating. Awesome. So yeah. now we're 23 years together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. I relationship. Yes. <laughs> That's beautiful. Beautiful. You know it's a blessing. Yeah. It, yeah, it, it is. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. absolutely. And Carrie Anderson in the chat room says therapy is vital um, yes. to mental health, yes. uh, which is so important because, like you said, especially in the African American community, um, it's just something that is not talked about. You know, you're you're told to keep quiet and, and to pray about it, um, and, and you know, and, and it's amazing how people think certain things can just make things magically disappear and that they're going to become non-existent. Um, and so, um, hey, Venetia, um, let's see, Arthur Vett Wilson. Um, she says, I've never gone to therapy for my abuse. I'm from the South and was told to shut up. So as a child, I never talked. Um, they thought something was wrong with me, but I was told so much um, to shut up. I did exactly that until one day I wrote my life story. Wow. Um, you know, and even that is is a mental health journey in itself, you know, and a therapy session in itself, you know, to write about um, and share about the things that you've experienced in your life. So um, uh, uh, that I'm glad I'm glad you wrote that life story, you know, um, so that others uh, will be able to, you know, take something away and heal from it. Because the thing about it um, is oftentimes people feel like they're alone. They're alone in these thoughts and they're alone, um, you know, in these feelings that they have. And so, Kimberly, what would be your words of advice? Uh, we have a, a lot of women tune in tonight and men. And to those who will rewatch the show later on, what can, pertaining to child abuse and childhood trauma, what would be your words of advice about um, healing from that? Hmm. To remember that it's a journey yeah. and to also remember, I know a lot of people say it's, it's so cliche. It is, it is not, yeah. it is not your fault. And to also remember that hurt people hurt people. So these people are just passing on this legacy of hurt right. and that if we go through, we, we have an opportunity to heal it. So we have an opportunity to, um, to stop this generational pain, I like to call it. Um, because, you know, it's, it's, it's something that we carry, especially uh, people of color on so many levels. We carry it on a cellular level. And I, on some level, I get it. It's like our community 
from the trauma, a lot of our people want to inadvertently protect us where they cause us the trauma in order to strengthen us. Yeah. And so that when we go out into the world and we experience this world, we are strengthened, not realizing that this trauma is actually, it's not strengthening us. Yeah. Yeah. It's hurting us and it's, it's hurting each of our generations. And so for the person out there that's suffering in silence, like in order to free your generations in order to free uh, even our ancestors, I like to think, yeah, yeah. Um, speaking yeah. our truth. It's like, it's uncomfortable at first, but if you just speak it, just speak it in your room, speak it. If you let it out, it causes toxicity in our body. It yeah. causes uh, just so many, it, 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 they've actually shown that it changes our DNA structure, wow. the trauma that we wow. go through. Yeah. And, and so, in order for us to heal, it is talking about it. It is knowing that you're not alone, like reaching out to authors, you know, who have written um, these, their stories, uh, you know, just talk. I, I cannot express talking about it that because secrecy is what was killing me. Yeah. And so even when I was diagnosed at 47 with colorectal cancer, I had this decision whether I would talk about it yeah. or, or go through it in secret. And I knew in that moment that the secrets are what helped to create this moment. Right. So I, talk, I just start talking about it. And that's what led to this advocacy and all of this stuff. Yeah. And healing. And healing. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's okay to get help. Yeah, it, it is so good to get help. Your life will be different. My life, I, I'm so happy to look back and see the difference in my relationship before and my relationship now. The difference yeah. in who I am now at 53 yeah. and who I was then. And I can see the lies that were told and how I lived them. Yeah. How I embodied them. Yeah. And now yeah. I'm like, oh, I'm shedding all that. <laughs> <laughs> Right, right. Because you know, me. it's love amazing you. that we, yes. you know, we start believing those lies. We you do. know, we start we taking do. in that thing of, well, maybe it was my fault. Maybe if I hadn't did this, or you know, and and you're thinking like, man, that's not me, you know. And then you get to, like you said, a, a certain point uh, in your age, and you're almost like, you know, I wish somebody would say. <laughs> Say something crazy like that to me now, you know. Uh, but it is, it's a part of as event uh vet says, accept, acknowledge, empathize, and heal, you know, from it. Um, and, and it's so true, um, and so powerful that we do do that. Hello, Coach Michelle Jackson. And um, of course, uh vet says heal the child within so the adult um can heal as well, and that's so 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 important. And um, of course, I know you mentioned um your uh colorectal um cancer that you experienced as well, and so um with that, um let's talk about that a little bit because a lot of folks don't always know what colorectal cancer is sometimes specifically and so for the folks out there what is it how does it affect the body give us some intel okay well colorectal cancer is a cancer that develops in your colon so it's in either in your colon or your or your hello <laughs> it's either in your colon or your rectum your sphincter it's it's in those areas and yeah. so depending on where it is and how if you have tumors and how big they grow um that's where they're addressing whether you have colon cancer colorectal cancer or um rectal cancer okay so there's actually a few variations but we kind of umbrella it <laughs> yeah, yeah under under one thing so when it, some of the some of the symptoms that i was getting um, before I was diagnosed, like I was going to the bathroom and I was, um, and I would go to have bowel movement, but blood was coming out. And at the beginning it was just a little, so it was just a little on the tissue. And I was like, mm -hmm. oh, okay. and you know, and I was feeling dizzy and lightheaded and bloated and, and, and those symptoms progressed. So I yeah. went to the doctor 
I had a little bit more blood on there. So they did an initial fecal occult test, which is an initial colorectal cancer test right. screening. And it came back negative, actually. Oh, wow. So that was January to March. Yeah. 2015. And then, so I told, so I just kept talking to her and advocating for myself. And she said, Hey, if you don't feel better, if this is still getting worse, I think it's just hemorrhoids, mm -hmm. which is what a lot of people say to us, right. like, especially if you have kids. Right. And I think it's just hemorrhoids, but if it gets worse, just let me know. So a month or two went by. And by this time, I'm having more blood and less stool is coming out. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling more lightheaded, not myself. I'm dizzy. I'm, I, I'm having memory issues. I'm just not feeling myself. Yeah. Um, my appetite is decreasing. And so, you know, I go back and they send me in for a consultation yeah. to get a, um, a colonoscopy. Again, I was 47. So at the time you had to be 50 to get that type of a screening. Wow. So I, I walked in yeah. and, I, I'm having, and this is July. So this is from January to July of 2015. And yeah. She, the nurse asked me, again, it's a consultation. She's like, hey, what's going on? I tell her. And then I, she's like, well, how much blood are you losing? And so this is a really good tip. If you are losing blood in your stool, take a picture. I took a picture of my toilet because I cannot measure that. Yeah. Volume, right? it's yeah. like, because it looked like a menstrual cycle by the time I, I saw wow. it. And wow. so I showed them the picture and like, okay, we're scheduling right away. <laughs> right, yeah. Oh, okay. And, and so then that's what led to them, you know, as soon as I woke up, they were like, you have a fist sized um, tumor in your sigmoid colon, which is, wow. you know, in your colon, you have this little hook in, you know, from yeah. the larger intestines and it goes, you know, and so I had this tumor here and they didn't even know how I was sitting there wow. without having perforated or obstructed because they could barely scope me. Type yeah. Of mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> Initially, when, when they first told you um, and gave you that diagnosis, what was your reaction? Of course, you knew something was off, you know, with your body, uh, which is good that you even recognize that because sometimes, you know, we all don't get those uh, alerts and red flags. And so when they gave you um, that diagnosis, what was your initial response? Well, <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting story because... Um, I went in for that colonoscopy a week later and they put me out. And when I woke up, my husband was sitting there with me and I'm loopy. And so we're joking, oh, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and the doctor comes in and he's just super stoic. And he's like, hey, um, I hate to tell you, but I found like a fist size tumor in your, in your sigmoid colon and it's malignant. That's all he said. And I was just like, you know, I, I just sobered up real quick. Yeah, yeah. Like, the vision was gone. Right. It, like, literally, my life changed. I was like, did you just say that I have cancer? Wow. Because he never even said the words, you have cancer. Wow. And I said, did you just say it? <laughs> right, and right. So, and he was like, yeah. And in that moment, I, I describe it as, like, rose-colored glasses. Where just my whole world looked different. Like, it just mm -hmm. dropped. Yeah. And I just, I just saw the world different. I look over my husband, we're crying, we're bawling and yes. we're left with this news. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And so how did it affect, um, like you said, with your family as well? And so how did it affect um, not only your husband, uh, but your children um, to hear, you know, about this? Well, interest, my children were in California because we lived in Washington State when I was diagnosed. Yeah. So my children were in California visiting their grandparents. So they didn't hear the news right away because uh, they were in, out there for the summer and they came like a few months, I mean, pardon me, a few weeks after I was diagnosed. Yeah. So we had some time to sit with it as a, you know, as a couple and kind of get where we wanted to go with it. And right. so when they came home, you know, we let them be home for like a day and then we, talk to them about it and it was it was devastating it's yeah. it's it's something that to tell your family especially your little kids they were so little at the time that mommy you know has cancer and it, it was weird because the word is so powerful 
that I, when we told them, they immediately broke down. But then later we asked, do you know what cancer is? And they said, no, we just know it's bad. Just bad. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's the, the, the thing is that we, when it comes to that um, word, it's, you know, it kind of takes your breath away, you know, um, to hear it. To be, you know, in the presence. I, I've been in the presence of family members and 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 heard that word. And the first, the first thing you automatically think is, this person's no longer going to be here with us. Like, you know, they're going to be taken away from us. And it automatically takes you into a negative head space, um, unfortunately. And so, um, doing that process, um, I, I know you mentioned um, earlier in the show that. So when did it lead to you getting a, is it a, a stomach, a stoma? Oh, yeah, an ostomy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a stoma. You were correct. Stoma. Okay, um, okay. Um, well, it's like I, I was diagnosed in July mm -hmm. of 2015. I started treatment in August of 2015. So I did like um, six weeks of oral chemo therapy, yeah. which are pills. So I took those. Um, combined with 33 radiation treatments to my pelvis, uh, wow. hips, and buttocks area. And so um, they did that 33, 33 times. Wow. And so when I was resting up for surgery, what they didn't realize is that they had over-radiated my colon to the consistency of tissue paper. Oh, wow. And so our our colon is, pro is like probably like the texture of the inside of our jaw clo is, is close as I think. Yeah, And so um, they over-radiated it. So I was resting up for surgery and I was supposed to get a temporary six-week ostomy because what they do in the surgery is called a resection. They go and they cut out the diseased parts of your colon. And if there's enough, they reattach it. And, you're, and you can go to the bathroom. You can have a normal bowel movement. Yeah. Um, with mine, because of my perforation and because, you know, it was, it was pretty dangerous, I almost died from that. Wow. Um, I was in the hospital for like 10 days. It was, it was really intense. And so yeah. they asked me to keep it instead of six weeks for two years in my ostomy. And yeah. so I said, okay, because they were worried about reoccurrence. Yeah. And so two years came up and, and I found life with my ostomy, whose name is Toodles, to be just fine. You know, yeah. it's, it has its challenges, but I just didn't want to go through another surgery. Yeah. And I felt like, I'm good with this. Yeah, yeah. I chose to keep uh, my ostomy permanently. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And, and you guys, if, if you follow her on social media, uh, she, you know, she bedazzled us out. You know, she, she rocks it. You know, very well. And uh, I remember not too long ago, I, I think you did a video of you dancing um, with the boa feathers. And I was just so excited. Like I, I was there, like I, I was really excited and just, um, I, I definitely cried that day uh, of, of seeing that and the joy and bliss of that. And so how did, how did you get to that point to embrace it? Because a lot of people, like you said, it's, it's something that's life changing, but like you said, you know, you knew what your options were. Um, and, and where things were headed. And so how did you get to that acceptance of, of what was going on? Well, when they first told me that I would get a six week ostomy, you know, you, I heard of ostomies before and I had this old outdated thought that it was like to the floor, this bag that you have on your yeah. head that goes down your leg and they strap yeah. on your leg. <laughs> yeah. Is that what it is? <laughs> so of course I took to Dr. Google <laughs> and so I started just Googling uh, images of ostomies and I saw people in swimsuits and I saw people on beaches and I was like, what? You can do yeah. that? Like, that's a thing. And so it, that, those positive images immediately gave me a positive feeling about what was happening. Yeah. So I just started looking into it and I was like, wow, like, okay, okay. And again, yeah. I still thought it was just going to be like a six week thing. Yeah. And then when you said two years, you know, I was just so grateful to have woken up from that surgery because when I went into that surgery, I actually told my husband before I, I went in, I was like, I don't think I'm going to make it. Mm. And so we have to have the talk. Yeah. Because it was that bad when, yeah. when they admitted me. And so when I woke up and I 
saw the sauce me, of course, it's jarring because I'm like, what is that? <laughs> like, you know, and then I have a male nurse, and then my husband's standing there, and they're taking <laughs> and all the poop is coming out. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> I'm a southern, I'm southern, and this is like what? yeah. <laughs> and and man, it, I'm so glad they I'm so thankful for that because yeah, like they taught me to laugh. Like my husband wasn't bothered, he was just so happy to see me there. Yeah, absolutely. And, he was in there trying to help. He wasn't bothered. The nurse was, the male nurse was like, give it a name and blame the noises on it. Like when it barked. Yeah. I was like, okay, I'll name it Fred. You know? <laughs> so it just, it, it gave me a positive, I already went into it with a positive thought that I'm here because of this bag. I, I, I get, I, you know, like a lot of people have negative um, thoughts and stigmas and connotations, but dude, I've had five extra years with my family. Mm. I've, I've been able to see my kids turn 18, 15, 13. That's a blessing. Yeah. I, I've I've been able to now celebrate 22 years of being married to my husband because I got five extra years. You know, I have older, yeah. I got to see them. I got to see my friends. And ostomy represents life to me. Yeah. So when I, when I, when I even though I've been hospitalized where I have challenges with it, I'm so grateful that those challenges are just minute compared to the blessings I've been given. Absolutely. 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 And one of the questions that um, comes from a listener from Instagram, um, this one comes from Kathy. Uh, she says, did you have any moments uh, where depression became a huge factor um, during um, your experience with colorectal cancer? Huh. I had moments, not depression. I had moments more of loneliness. Um, okay. I had a lot of fear because, you know, there was a few, it was, it was, it was really challenging. I lost yeah. 30 pounds in a month. I was bedridden for most of my treatment. Um, my husband would have to carry me to the bathroom. He had to wipe me, help me. It was, you yeah. know, my kids were seeing this and I was just, it was the first time in my life I had ever been sick like that. Yeah. You know? And and it was a challenge. It slowed me down enough to pause. And so when I paused, I was able to see things differently. So I think that helped me to not be depressed because yes. all of a sudden, because I'm moving so slow and can barely move, I'm able to see and sit and look at my kids in a different way when they're in yeah. the Because I can't move. Yeah. So I'm sitting here and I'm I'm looking at them with this light and I'm watching comedies and, you yeah. know, I'm, I, I'm just, I, I just was working to fill myself with things that help me to feel good. Yeah. You know, and uh, it helped. I lived in a legal state too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it's medicinal there, and so yeah. those, I just did things that helped me to to keep my mindset strong. Absolutely. Because what I realized about that battle, I tried to fight it uh, physically. Because when I first was diagnosed, when we were driving home that day after we got the news, mm -hmm. I made up in my mind that I was going to kick cancer's butt. Right. <laughs> but I said the expletive, and I said. <laughs> Stop and get a bottle of champagne. We're going to toast to me being in, on the other side of this thing. Mm. Well, I'm so glad I did that because I was speaking life into my situation. Uh, because, man, it was whipping me up and down. The, I was, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and so that helped me to realize, you know, that each day was a gift. Everything that I was seeing, like I started to see flowers for the first time. Mm -hmm. I start to see nature for the first time. I'm seeing my husband in a different way. I'm seeing him care for the kids. And I was just seeing things. So yeah. it helped it helped me to not feel depressed. However, I did feel alone because yeah. my husband would have to go to work, my kids would have to go to school, people yeah. are working, there's no one to keep me company for yeah. the day. So yeah. loneliness was something that was something I had to overcome. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And, well, you know, you mentioned having your husband and, uh, you know, being supportive um, of you the entire way. And so um, did you expect that? Because a lot of times, you know, when it comes to us being sick and, and me, me and helping, you know, we're like, oh, boy, and I don't know how this is going to go. <laughs> you know, so uh, did you expect him to just you know, jump right on in there and, you know, do what he needed to do. I expected it. I didn't expect it to the level in which he did it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, like I said, we had been to, I think we were married for 17 years. So I've had, you know, I just, yeah. I, he's been such a healing force in my life. Yeah. You know, so I knew he would be there for me. Absolutely. I didn't realize the level of excellence and care. I mean, he he rarely slept. He has three little kids. He's making their breakfast, lunch, and dinner. He's making my breakfast, lunch, and before he goes to work. He has to work yes. all the time because his job did not want him to take off. Mm. He's, he's leaving work and coming home, putting me in the car, driving me to treatment, coming back, putting me back in the bed, going back to work. Wow. That, that type of deal. Doing yeah. laundry, cooking, cleaning. I don't know how he did it. <laughs> but he, and he did it with such excellence. And he never, not once, made me feel yeah. less or that, that I was a bother. It, yeah. he, it was like, he was just happy to do it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that was not something I experienced growing up. Anytime yeah. I was sick, it was, a, it was, a, it was bothersome. Yeah. So... Yeah. I felt like that experience was so healing for me. I, I yeah. was able to heal a little, some of my childhood trauma around that. Being cared for. Cared for, yeah. Yeah. And nurtured. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, Coach Michelle Jackson says, um, um, I've been having a colonoscopy every two years um, since my 30s. She says, I'm so glad you found out early enough. Mm. Um, you know, uh, and, and that's the thing, you know, <clears throat> when it comes to our bodies, and it's interesting how um, as women, we're always encouraging our husbands and men, go to the doctor, go to the doctor, you know, but with us, we're like, oh, it'll be okay, you know, <laughs> or, or whatnot. And so, you know, we just kind of brush it over. Uh, and so, you know, did you have that, uh, the first the first few signs that you saw, you know, did you think, okay, well, you know, this a pass over, or did you immediately decide, you know what, I need to get to the doctor? Yeah. No, no, I, you know, looking back, I think I have been having the symptoms for quite a while. Yeah. For, you know, for, for longer, because the, for that tumor to grow the way that it did, mm -hmm. you know, it just shows how disconnected we are from our bodies and yeah. from what's happening on a lot of levels. And, you know, I felt pretty connected. I've been doing healing work for over 23 years, you know, so yeah. I'm really connected about myself. And yeah. what it showed me is there's still levels of connectedness that we have mm -hmm. to work on and do because this yeah. this was lingering inside of me. So it took me a while. And once, yeah. once those things, you know, it, it was trusting self to say, you know what, I don't need to push through this. It's okay. Yeah. To go and find out what this is. As a matter of fact, I, I want to know. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And, and doing a little research, I, I found, um, according to um, the CDC, uh, was that uh, colorectal cancer is actually the second leading cause, uh, leading cancer. Um, it is the third most common cancer that men and women, that affects men and women. Um, and so... Um, it, you know, when it comes to this um, and spreading awareness about this, I know a lot of people may ask you, well, is it something that you ate or, you know, what, you know, what was it? And so what have you learned um, that that may trigger, you know, trigger that? Well, I mean, there's so, you know, there's so much data out there that's being yeah. collected, and I've had a chance to read quite a bit, quite a yeah. bit but still yeah. so much more. But yeah, you know, I, I think for me, it was the childhood uh, trauma yeah. uh, connection because, yeah. you know, what happens in our bodies, like I said, our DNA actually can change. And so I feel like me holding in that uh, secret was yeah. one of the things. And, um, and like, 
uh, Coach Michelle is saying it can be genetic as well, but yeah. Yeah. for that, that was not something that any of my family has had. So yeah. I was I was the one to have this here. Yeah. And so I think it was a lot of the emotional, physical connection. For some people, it's because like cancer is basically from what I have learned, can't everybody has a can cancer genes. It's just okay. that some go rogue. So something can trigger it. And we don't always know what the trigger is. And right. I don't really like to spend a lot of time focused on that because right. we go into like, was I able to prevent it? And people, yeah. well, I don't spend a lot of time on that. I do know that it's important to you know, make sure our mental health is strong and Absolutely. Examine those type of links and our, you know, our physical man, you know, as strong as it can be. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's the realization that these things can happen because it's just something that happens. Yeah. And the best thing is to get on it as soon as possible, because I'm so glad I didn't wait. I could have, if I just kept waiting and ignoring it, I could have died. Yeah. I would have died. Yeah. And so I'm glad I caught it at stage two because it was just going into stage three. Yeah. So if you're feeling these things, go in talk to them. I, you know, one thing I've learned through all of these years, <laughs> five years of, of yeah. what I've gone through is advocate for yourself. They will tell you it is nothing. They will tell you this is normal. If you don't feel normal, especially as women of color. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, if yeah. you don't feel normal, push, push, push and push in love. You don't, yeah. you know, I've learned to advocate for myself in a way that they're excited to do it for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and if they're not excited, I, I've fired care teams. I just go get someone else. Yeah. You have that option too. We, we have that right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and, like and I'm glad you mentioned that because a lot of times we don't know that, you know, we don't know going into these places. And I just had a conversation with a, a, well, actually one of my best friends um, about some experiences that she had at the doctor. And, you know, I said, you know, you can always go get a second opinion. You don't have to take, you know, what they're saying to you, you know, as the all be it all. And I think that we've gotten so accustomed to, oh, well, the doctor says I have such and such and here's your prescription. Take this for, you know, for a certain amount of days and you'll be all right. And so, like you said, to advocate on our behalf, especially um, as women of color, because oftentimes uh, we're just um, overlooked, <laughs> you know, we're at poo -poo. We're poo -poo. on a push, <laughs> push going out the door, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I mean, I, I've seen it even, you know, as a patient, mm -hmm. you know, um, so it's like learning um, to to put myself in rooms where I can get the most information so Absolutely. that I can be the best self advocate. Because a lot of times we are the person in the room that's, that's pushing yeah. and requiring these tests. Yeah. You know, like I, 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 I'll give a quick thing. I, I went, I just changed colorectal surgeons because I moved to Kentucky. And so I'm changed over all my care team. And yeah. I went to see this guy and I would had a colonoscopy the year before, but when I went to see him last year, yeah. I was having some blood in my stool. So it bothered me. So yeah. I went to see him and he was like, oh, the guy who did it last year, he's amazing. He's like, oh, I know his work. He's so good. He's so great. And I just looked at him <laughs> and I'm on the table and he's telling me this. And I just said, so what, what do you want me to do? Because right. he's the youngest I will ever be with this <laughs> ostomy and with this issue. Yeah. So I just asked him, I just was like, what would you do? Yeah. Like, what do you want me to do? Mm -hmm. Just say, mm -hmm. just agree that your friend is the best. Right. I mean, you don't, if things can change in a year, look at COVID. Come on. Yeah. Yeah, so a lot of stuff changed in a year, but you're telling me my body can't change in a year. Right. So I just I heard him and I said that, and when I put that back to him, he was like, oh, "Oh, okay. Well, if you want me to do it, I'll do it." You know, and I was just like, "Okay, but now I don't want you to do it. I'm yeah. gonna do someone else." Yeah. But it it was that realization of like, if I feel something is off, it is okay for me. It is okay for me to go in and talk to you about it and, yeah. and us to find the best um, 
course of action for it. And yes, it is one thing I didn't realize the very first time. And I want to say that because you brought up a great point, Bianca. Mm -hmm. It's like when you get these diagnoses, diagnoses, it's okay to take a pregnant pause. It feels like you're going to die right away mm -hmm. because it's happening, right? Yeah. I remember that feeling. And you're like, I got to do it. I got I to gotta start mm -hmm. right away. That that pregnant pause, I have learned to do that in my care now so that yeah. I can have time to see, do I feel good about what you're telling me? Mm -hmm. Do I feel good about this course of action? Do I feel good about you Yeah. as a care provider? Yeah. We have a right to do that. We have a right to go get second, third opinions. Yeah. And, and by the time you collect all that information, yeah. you'll feel better about your choices. Absolutely. You know, because the, the, the truth of the matter is that a lot of, and, it, and it's nothing, nothing against health providers. We love you guys. But, you know, sometimes we run across some individuals who truly could care less about our well-being, you know, um, and they want to put a Band-Aid over it. You know, and okay, this is what you need to do. And I'm one of those people that I believe, you know, we, we won't let people do certain things to our kids when we take our kids to the doctor, you know, so we have to be the same way about ourselves, you know, um, you know, and, and I think if, if we don't speak up, we'll continue um, to be overlooked, underdiagnosed, and, you know, all the different things, you know, that take place um, in our communities. And so, um, for you um, and, and the process um, of of healing throughout all of this, uh, what what have you learned about yourself um, during this process of um, colorectal cancer and, and becoming a survivor and uh, just just living an amazing life now? And so, what have you learned about yourself during that process? Wow. <laughs> Uh, that's a great question. Um, I've learned a lot. Yeah. And the biggest thing is that I am worthy. Yeah. That took me a long time. It's been a process. It's been a work in process. Yeah. You know, a uh, work in progress, pardon. And I realized that I am worthy and that I have everything in me that I need. Mm. I am everything that I need. Yeah, and that's powerful because it's like it doesn't mean I'm everything and I don't need anyone. No, no, no. That's, yeah. that's, that's not it. It means because I have everything in me that I need, I can go and I can ask people for help. I can I can be vulnerable enough to ask for help. I can be vulnerable enough to get mental health treatment. I can I can do those things, you know, yeah. like, that's what that means. I'm, I'm everything that I need. I am worthy of healing. I am worthy of being a part of these communities. I, you know, I am, I am worthy of having a, a great life, a peace filled life. Absolutely. That's what I got. I was like, wow. It's, and, and, and I like to also use the seed analogy because <laughs> I garden. And, yeah. so I <laughs> and so what I realized is that we're all seeds, right? Yeah. So that's my new thing now. I'm like, we're seeds. <laughs> <laughs> and when, when you put seed in the soil, what you water it and feed it with is mm. how that plant grows or doesn't grow. And we, Absolutely. Are, we are seeds. Yeah. So when we're feeding ourselves with, we're watering ourselves with these words, with these, with these feelings, with these affirmations or negative yeah. things, that's what's growing. Yeah. And, and the coolest thing I learned about that was that even though we'll have these moments that no matter how positive, you know, we can be, we still have these moments and that we don't have to stay in it. Yeah. We can actually prune back what's not working for us and yeah. begin to feed and water all the good stuff, all yeah. the love, I am worthy, I am this, all of that good stuff back yeah. in and grow something new. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to stay there. That's yeah. powerful to me. Yeah. We can yeah. have a totally different reality. Yep. It's it's power. That was power. That was powerful for me. 
Yeah, absolutely. Because it lets us know that um, we always get a, another chance. You know, a lot of times when people say they're having a rough day, it's like, all right, I get a do over tomorrow. You know, <laughs> I, I get a, you know, I can, I can change this around. And, and, uh, and sometimes we can change it around in that day. You know, it's like you said, it's, it's what we're putting inside of us. You know, sometimes we can get so down and heavy on ourselves. Um, and if we, like you said, watch the words that we're taking in and, and, and applying to ourselves, we'll see the change, you know, the, the headache may go away the, the the tenseness in your body and so um i myself <laughs> have, have had to do that quite a bit uh you know and so and i've asked tons of guests this and i know you uh, talked a little bit about uh what you learned through the the process of the colorectal cancer but with this pandemic going on um so much has changed um, you know, and with people and the way they, they're doing things. And so what have you learned about yourself during this pandemic that maybe you didn't realize beforehand? <laughs> like the garden <laughs> that, I, that I'm, that I'm more, that I am more creative than I give myself credit for. Yeah. 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 Like I, I didn't realize like I could decorate and you know, do things like that. And, yeah. you know, I, I never saw myself as that, but being able to be home all the time and going, okay, right. I'm gonna, I can't change my physical environment, but I can change it. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, I, I, I learned those things. Um, and, and it's interesting because the pandemic didn't really change my life. I was already working from home. Yeah. I was already homeschooling our kids. So we were already homeschooling. Yeah. I was working from home. So nothing changed except we couldn't go out. Yeah. So being home all the time, it it gave me, um, yeah, it, it was just different because I got to see people live my life. <laughs> yeah. You know, and my, yeah. Kids, my kids were even like, oh, kids get to see what it's like when we homeschool. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> It was just, I felt like I was more watching um, experiences and, and seeing how people um, push through or, or how yeah. challenging life can be at times. Yeah. And, yeah. And communities that form out of that. It was, it yeah. was really cool to watch. It's really cool to be. Absolutely. Cool. And, and I thought it was interesting for me to, uh, because for me, I, I've been a stay at home mother for years. I went back and started teaching. And, um, and so once COVID hit, it kind of shut things back down. And so it put, really put a lot of people in a reality check. And for me, it was kind of like, I, you know, I've been here, done that. So <laughs> exactly. I was like, yeah. Welcome to my world. <laughs> And plus, Absolutely. You know, plus having like a disability, you know, and, and I at, at times I've had immune compromised system yeah. for a long time. And so, you know, um, it took me a while to get back on my feet after my treatment, you know, yeah. and all of that. So I was used to that slower life pace of life anyway. Absolutely. So a lot of us in the disability community, we were like, welcome to our world. You get to see what it's like when you cannot be a part of the world. Absolutely. You know, so it was it was interesting to watch it from those different aspects. Absolutely. And so for that 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 person out there who um may have received that 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 cancer diagnosis, maybe going through treatment, um what what would be your words of encouragement to them um about getting through um the process? Hmm. To Remember that the battle, while your body might be going through the treatment, the battle is mental. Mm -hmm. And so the sooner that you make up in your mind what you want out of the battle and the journey of it, yeah, better. So I, I'm like me going that day, I'm so glad I made that decision for myself that day. So that worked for me, right? Yeah. And so making up in your mind what you want, um, Allow yourself to be taken care of. Allow yourself to be a part of communities that can also help support you and give you more information so you don't feel so alone. You know, because loneliness, I think it's probably loneliness and depression. Yeah, probably two yeah, of the biggest yeah. things you hear people talking about. So just, again, it's, it's like anything, keep talking. Um, know that you're worthy of being heard you know, and that your experience is valid. And also to grieve 
I think you brought that up earlier and yeah. grieving is a huge part of the process to healing. Absolutely. So when you go through that battle, you're going to lose things. Life is going to change. It's not going to be the same. You won't go. I was under this misconception that I would go through treatment. I would be better and my life would be normal again. It will not be the same. And that's a wonderful thing. Um, I'm so glad it's, it's different, but it's, but you don't realize that. So yeah. it, it creates this sadness of yeah. that life is different. So it's, it's, I say, grieve that grieve that your body's changed, grieve, and then realize that this, your body's going to do whatever it does because people get all kinds of prognosis and everybody doesn't make it through this battle, yeah. right? So realize that it's mental. Your body might fail. Our bodies might transition. Yeah. This is powerful. Absolutely. To, to just surround yourself with, with just people who are wanting to uplift you and, Absolutely. and fill you with prayers and positive light and laughter Absolutely. and and, and it's okay to laugh. Yeah. <laughs> I feel about my ostomy all the time. It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> and it helps. It helps. It helps to have brevity, you know, yeah. it, it really does. And, yeah. and to realize that, you know, this is your battle. You get to choose how you fight it and you get yeah. to choose how you do this journey. You're not alone. There's so many of us out there just ready to support and, and happy to advocate. Absolutely. 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 And um, Carrie Anderson said, thank you for sharing your journey. Uh, you have been inspirational as well. And so, um, you know, and, and that's my my hope when we do shows like this, because um, there's so many people that deal in silence with, with so much, you know, um, you know, and from where we talked about earlier in the show, the childhood trauma and abuse and things that they've experienced, um, you know, to getting diagnosis and not knowing um, how their life is going to change or shift or, or whatnot. And so just being able to see someone that says, hey, it's okay to laugh. It's okay to, you know, cry if you need to get the healing that you need to um, can definitely reassure somebody in a great way. And like I said, um, I'm always, always excited um, to see your energy on social media because I think it is just amazing um, and beautiful in itself. And so um, uh, thank you so much for encouraging people just in general, you know, not not because of, of this cause or, or one cause of another, but just in general to to live their life um, authentic, authentically, uh, you know, in the best way that, that they know how. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I Absolutely. appreciate that so yeah. much. <laughs> it's, you know, it's like um, I get when the old folks say I wouldn't take nothing for my journey. Yeah. And that's odd if you knew the trauma and things that I've been through. And it's, it's, I, I, I'm so blessed to be able to sit here and say that. Yeah. It's, it's like to see that if my journey can help someone, you know, because other people's journeys have helped me yeah. to be at this point too. I didn't get here by myself, you know? Yeah. And so we all like stand on the shoulders of one another. And Absolutely. So it's just thank you so much for having me and including me um, in this conversation of healing, Absolutely. of overcoming trauma. You know, we are all worthy of it. We Absolutely. are so worthy of having a, a wonderful life. We don't have to live under yeah. those those falsehoods that have um, in, that we have we've worn all of our lives like yeah. a coat. It's okay to take it off. Yeah, you yeah. know, and and show who you really are. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. A beautiful thing. And so um, I appreciate you. And um, tell the folks out here if they would like to connect with you, um, how they can go about um, connecting with you as far as social media. Yes. Come join me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on Instagram, the, the TikTok, <laughs> and Facebook. You know, I, I just my my page is just about like what Bianca said. I, I I just you know I'm so happy and thankful to be here, and you know feel good and feel at peace with life. So I just want to share that with everyone. So that's what my page is about. It's yeah, you know, it's just about like 
learning and and just growing through this journey of life. And so come join me. You know, I yeah. I show my ostomy. I I burlesque. I do pole. I dance. Yes. I'm I'm silly. I just I love life. So. <laughs> Absolutely. They get to see how you pedazzle um toodles um, yes. and all that great stuff. So it is amazing. Yeah, she has all kinds of my ostomy has all kinds of covers. She performs uh, she's performed in Australia, she's performed all across the country. Amazing. Yeah. Now, I, I don't I, I've tried bringing her out, but I've bought my covers now. And so okay. so she matches she, you know, she matches my um outfits. So yeah, she's nice. She's brown. Yeah. <laughs> I absolutely love it. I love it. I love your energy. Uh, I love uh, the energy and the great vibes that you put out to everyone. And I truly appreciate you coming on here um, and being so open, transparent, sharing your journey uh, with, with strangers and myself. But, you know, it, it is absolutely phenomenal. And uh, as I always say, um, you never know um, who will be touched or inspired uh, by, you know, your story and, and sharing your story with people. And so we hope that um, tonight um, uh, Kimberly has did just that, you guys. And so uh, once again, thank you so much for coming on here. I truly appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, <laughs> for the beautiful comments. I was yes. reading them. And thank you. I appreciate the support and yes. the love and, you know, just sending it all back to you guys. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, well, I you have to have in person one day. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, hope, I, know. Know. I, I know. Hopefully, we'll be we'll be saying that soon. I'm I'm praying yeah. that we do. Uh, but I hope you have a great rest of your evening and week. And I'll be in, definitely in touch uh, with you again soon. You yeah. too. Absolutely. Talk to you soon. Okay. Bye bye. bye. <laughs> All right, you guys, that was Kimberly H. Coleman. You guys, I'll make sure you go and check her out on uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram. As she said, she is on the TikTok. Uh, so you guys go and check her out over there as well. And so we're going to get ready to get out of here. And I'm going to see you guys next. Next Tuesday, we're going to have um, more awesome special guests coming up for you. Uh, but make sure you go and connect with us on the Beautiful Butterfly Show so you can see who's coming up next. Um, and so for you guys who will watch the replay, we thank you for taking the time um, as you re-catch the um, replay of the show tonight. So with that said, folks, we're going to get ready to get out of here. I am B-Fly. I'll see you next Tuesday, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great one.